All right. How are we doing this morning? Blessed? Amen? Too blessed to be stressed? We got all the... We got all the... Uh, what do they call it? Um, I'm drawing a blank. The cliches. We got all the Christian cliches down, right? Huh? We know the verbiage. We know the language. Don't take very long to be able to figure all those things out, right? The question is, right? The question is, if we speak it, do we know how to live it? Right? We're adaptable people. You know, there's one of those things in the wild. You take a pig, right? A regular pig. You put him into captivity, what happens? He starts to turn pink. His little tail starts to go curled up a little bit. His tusks go away, and he becomes this docile, domesticated, uh, uh, pink-looking pig for the most part, right? You let that pig out of captivity, right? Within three days, within three days, that pig starts to change its color. He starts to grow hair, right? And it's that coarse black, it's white hair, right? His tusks start to grow, and it becomes... It starts to become this wild pig again because you let him out there in the wild, right? You know, I, I, I say that because it's kind of like us in a sense, right? <laughs> and, uh, you know, when we're, when we're within the cover of the church or the cover of Jesus Christ, right, we become different, if you will, right? We become more, more docile. We become more domesticated, if you will. But you, you put us out there in the streets, man, and in the world, and it don't take very long, right? We start to adapt. We're very adaptable people. You know, one of the scariest things, I think, for most people is change. We, we, get, we get timid or, or uh, reserved, if you will, when change comes, right? We don't like change. We don't know how to deal with change. Once we become accustomed to a certain way of life, let's say, if you're running around, if you're doing your thing, you're in sin, whatever the case is, it doesn't even matter, right? Because eventually we get to a place in our lives where we start to become used to it. We're creatures of habit. You get up in the morning, and I've shared this, this story before, and, and I'll share it again, but, you know, it's like every day I come home from work, and, and, and I take the stuff out of my pockets, you know, and I have stuff in every pocket pretty much, right? And, and when I take it out, it goes, you know, my knife, my keys, my wallet, my comb, my headphones, um, <laughs> you know, all this stuff is lined up, right? And, 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 and when I wake up in the morning, I put my pants on, I put my shirt on, and everything goes right back. My, my headphones go in the right pocket, my knife goes here, my wallet in the, in the back right, my, my comb in the left, whatever, my phone in the left front pocket, right? Everything goes in a certain pocket. But sometimes my wife will need to grab something out of my wallet, she'll need to get the keys or whatever the case is. If it's not laid out where I left it, I'll forget it. I'll leave the house without it, and then I'll be in my truck and be like, oh no, I left my wallet at home. But how did I forget it? Because I'm so used to being this creature of habit that I set these things up, and if they get moved, and it might be like, like, like organized chaos where I, I know where it's at. And it might not be the right place, but I know where it's at. And so when I go back to get it, if it's not there, there's a problem. Who moved it? Which one of you kids touched my stuff? <laughs> you know, <laughs> this morning I'm, I'm doing my little boy's hair, you know, and I'm like, where's the comb? You know, who, who moved the comb? You know, the funny thing is nobody, nobody seems to know. It, it's, uh, <laughs> there's these infamous people. You find them. You find these infamous people, you guys tell me where they're at because I don't want to talk to them. It's the I don't know people, you know? And, and, and when we find these guys, we're going to have a conversation because they have all the information, right? They know who broke the window on the car. They know who, who didn't put the shovels back in the shed, you know? They, all the, these guys know everything about everything, right? It's the, it's the I don't know people, you know? And it's the funniest thing because... You live in the same home, and it's all the same people there, so it's one of the six, right? <laughs> but nobody seems to know what happened to it. <laughs> anyway, I don't know how I got on that, but uh, um, I, I guess part of the, the, uh, the moral of the story, if you will, is, uh, you know, we, we, we find ourselves in those places of, you know, comfort, 
convenience. We don't want a lot of change. We don't like to, to, to do things differently. We become creatures of habit. And when something stirs that up a little bit, you know, what do we do in the midst of that? What do we do in the midst of the chaos? What do we do when, when somebody has changed your pattern? And I think that's the difficulty sometimes is because our patterns, we're, we're, we're at, le- at least, you know, maybe I'm speaking to myself, maybe you guys are different, but I know for me it's, it's a pattern. When my patterns get changed, it's when all of a sudden I don't, I don't know how to, how to deal with the situation, right? And, and, and I become accustomed to these patterns in my life. Well, we're going to look at an individual this morning in his life. And, and uh, I tell you what, man, this individual's life was stirred up a lot. We're going to be in Philippians chapter 3. We're going to look at a few verses. I don't know that we'll get through the whole section, but we'll see what, what we can do, and we'll try to get through it. But you guys will get the gist of it. I, I've asked myself this question, and this is kind of a question that was, um, I guess, presented to me young in my faith. Um, and it was the question of what do you consider the definition of success, right? What do you consider the definition of success? So if somebody asked you, you know, I, I always liken it to, i never done this. I, I went to high school in ninth grade, and then we got kicked out, and I went to continuation school and, and all this kind of stuff. So I never, I never had the high school reunions, you know, uh, I didn't do the dances and all that kind of stuff that a lot of these kids did and all this. And then you go back and you meet all your high school buddies and friends. And, and uh, you know, that, that wasn't my life. I never did that. But some people do. But I kind of liken it to that. Let's say you went back 20 years to your high school reunion and you've seen all your old friends there. And, and, uh, and they ask, well, what are you doing now? You know, the question, it, it, it comes up, right? You know, well, what, what are you doing now? Where, where are you working? You know, what, what's your life look like? You know, and, and do you look at your life 20 years ago and look where you are 20 years down the road and you, and you say, man, that's exactly where I wanted to be. This is where my life was. This is where I seen my life in 20 years. And now I'm meeting these people that I went to high school with 20 years ago at our reunion. And they ask you that question, you know, well, what are you doing nowadays? What's your life been like? You know, and then, and then you ponder the question and you ask yourself that very thing. Do I, do I look at my life and I say, man, I've lived a successful life. This is, this is what I pictured myself doing 20 years ago or five years ago or 10 years ago or whatever the case may be. And do you look at your life as it being successful and not, and, and, and not successful in the sense or definition of the, what the world's uh, uh, standards would be? But if you're a believer and you're a Christian and you're looking at your life as a Christian and you're looking at what what, what God would call you to, do you look at your life from a Christian standard and say, that's a successful life? And what does that look like? So I look at Paul. And you look at Paul's life. And you ask yourself that question. And I've often asked myself that question. And it was kind of one of those things where it was presented to me, but it was also one of those things that I that I had, to, I had to come to grips with in my life because I was young when I started running around. I was 10 years old when I was running around drinking and doing drugs and stuff, and, and, and I had to grow up at a young age. And I remember from 10 to probably 19, so probably nine good years, of living in a life of rebellion and, 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 and running. You know, I grew up in the church. I knew about Jesus. I knew of Jesus, but I, but I didn't know Jesus. I didn't know him on that personal level. I knew of him. We went to Sunday school. I went to vacation Bible school. I sang all the songs, you know, Noah is going to build an archy archy, you know, uh, uh, this little light of mine, you know, the Bible tells me so. Jesus loves me, right? All these different little, little uh, 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 hooks and, 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 and songs that you sing as a kid, you know. And I, and I went to Awanas and, and did the Bible verses that you had to memorize and run the relays and go through the books and all this kind of stuff, you know. But I, but I still wanted to dabble in the world. I still wanted that little bit of pleasures from the world. I didn't want to give it all up. I still liked the music I listened to. I still liked my rap music, you know, Mac-10 and Tupac and 
you know, all these guys as a kid, man, I didn't want to give it up. And then relationships, right? I didn't want to give up the, 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 not that I was in a relationship or had a girlfriend or any of that, but it was just the desire for that one day, let's say that presented itself. I didn't want to give up that, oh, I have to be married now. I can't just go date this girl and, and be with her and sleep with her and everything be fine. You know, I've got to, I've got to look to this other future that I, I was afraid of and didn't want no part of, you know. And so you kind of rebel. And then you think to yourself, like, oh, I've got I've to change my life and come to Jesus. I've got to stop, you know, doing the drugs. I've got to stop doing this. I've got to do all these things first, and then I'm going to come to the Lord when I'm at that place. You know, and the reality is, if you just come to him, he changes all that for you. You don't have to change anything. You come just as you are. What happens is as you become mature in your walk with Christ, he starts to change the desires that you once had, and your desires change, your life changes, your thinking changes, the people you hang out with changes, your life changes, right? And I always had goals. Why don't we pray and then we kind of get into it. Father, we come before you again and we thank you for this morning. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the lives of the individuals that we get to look at in your word, in in your holy scriptures. And Lord, we can glean those things from them, Father, that we know will create create within us a deeper, more personal relationship with you, but also change us and transform us and to make us the men and women that you've called us to be. And so this morning, Lord, we look at the life of Paul and we ask you, Lord, that you would help us. Help us to look at this individual and to be able to glean those very things. God, how can you help us to be more dependent upon you in a deeper relationship with you? How can we love you more, get to know you more? And so we look at your word this morning, God, and ask that you would speak to us. Give us ears to hear, hearts that want to listen and be changed and transformed by the renewing power of your spirit and your word, Lord, we pray. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So anyway, that, you know, that's kind of in a nutshell, you know, the, 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 the premise behind it. But, but again, the question I asked myself was that very thing, you know, the, the definition of success. And we have to ask ourselves that because, I, I, at least I don't know about you, but for me, you know, I wanted to live this Christian life. I wanted to be a believer. But I also wanted things in life, and I wanted to have things in life, and I wanted that balance to be okay to where I could be a, a, a believer, a lover of Jesus, raise my family that way, but not have to do it in such a way where, where maybe I didn't have anything. Maybe there's a balance there, and, and maybe that was the, the call for my life or your life or whatever the case is. But then I looked at Paul's life, you know, and these are goals in my head that I had set up and kind of what I wanted to do. But then I look at the definition of success and I think to myself, what I've come up in my head with and my definition of what I, de- what I deem to be success in my life. And again, I likened it to Paul. Here you have an individual. If you look at his letters that he wrote throughout the scriptures, many times he began the letter with, with the same type of phrase and it was Paul an apostle, right? Paul, an apostle of God, called by God to be an apostle, not by the will of man, but by the will of God, and so forth and so forth. And, and, and I started to ask myself, why does Paul always write his letter that way? Well, here's the thing, right? Paul never walked with Jesus. You know, he never, he never spent that time with Jesus in a physical sense. Now, Jesus revealed himself to him, and revealed the, 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 the beauty and the gospel and the message of the scriptures to Paul on the road to Damascus when he was blinded, not only spiritually, but physically. Paul was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, Sadducee of the Sadducee, right? This guy was, was learned and was raised in the, in, in the books and the knowledge of the scriptures and the law and so forth, right? He knew all these things. And, but, but he always questioned his calling. Because he wasn't like the other apostles, right? He didn't, he didn't live his life like the other apostles. Here you have an individual that was ripping people out of their houses and murdering Christians because of what they believed. And then you had him now preaching the same gospel that he, that he, he would, would, would rip people out of their homes and, 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 and kill them because they preached or they believed in. And now he was doing the same thing. So you can imagine 
when his friends caught wind of this and seen him, they would question his faith, right? Or question his authority. Who is this guy? You know, one day he's out there killing people, and now he's proclaiming these, these very things. Who is this guy that he says that? So you could imagine not only that, but you might have that same thing take place in your life, and you have your family and loved ones around you, or maybe people next to you or whatever the case is, that might claim that it's your faith, and it's not real. And I believe Paul had that in his head. So very often he had to always share with what he was called and why he was called and that God himself had called him, right? I'm an apostle. Not because I just woke up one morning and said, you know what, this is what I want to be, but because God pulled him out of the pit of hell, right, and called him to be, and God gave him that authority. And so at the end of the day, if we realize and understand the scriptures and we know what they say, that all authority has been given by God, and you come and, and, and you go against what Paul's calling was, then you, in essence, are fighting against God himself. Because all authority had been given by him, right? And so Paul, many times, he found himself in that place where, where people would question whether or not he was real. So here you have a man who was questioned whether or not he, tr he truly was a believer. He was shipwrecked. He was cold. He was naked. He was homeless. He didn't have a place to lay down his, his, his head. He tent made, so he made tents. He would do little side jobs here and there to get a little bit of money to be able to continue his journey. If, if somebody opened the door for him and let him in their homes, then he would come in and he would sleep in their home. Maybe they would break bread with him, give him some food. If they didn't, what, did he, what would he do? He'd shake the dust off his sandals and he'd keep on going to the next place, right? And so forth and so forth. And he was received by people, but he never asked anybody for anything. And he, and he went about it in such a way where he, where he wanted to make sure that he wasn't a burden upon anybody. Not married, no kids that we're aware of. Didn't have this fancy job. Nice home. They stoned him to death, threw him out of the gates. And this the same man that got up and went right back into the gate said, I'm not going out like that. His own people, his own countrymen, the Bible says, didn't like him. History tells us and tradition tells us that he wasn't very good looking. Maybe shorter, red hair, kind of big nose, you know. Wasn't anything to look at. So you think about his life, and you look at his life, and he didn't have much going for him. He didn't have anything to show for. Would you look at that man's life into yourself, and you say, man, you know what? That's probably one of the most successful people, successful lives in a, in a spiritual standpoint, from a spiritual perspective. That's probably one of the most successful lives that has ever been shown and revealed to us in the Scripture. Would you look at that and say that? Because it might not be your definition, it might not be my definition. But the definition of what Jesus Christ calls success, this man is probably one of the most successful people that's ever lived. But would we look at it that way? Because the world ingrains itself within our lives and teaches us what is success? And many times we find ourselves in that very place where we think like that. And so with that mindset, we look at his life, we look at the things that he's, that he's involved in, we look at what he went through, and we look at his mindset, and now from that perspective of a successful life compared to mine or yours, this is Paul and where he's at. So we start in verse 8, Philippians chapter 3. Paul says, yet I indeed also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. We talked a little bit about it in the beginning, Paul's pedigree, right? His, his, not only his pedigree, but his, his religious pedigree, his livelihood, who he was, how he was raised, and, and, and his background, if you will. Paul 
was probably one of the most knowledgeable individuals on the law, on Scripture, on these very things, to be a Roman. He's in a Roman prison right now under house arrest, right? As he writes this very thing, he's finding himself in a trial as it is, locked up. And he would count all these things as a loss in the view of the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus. And it wasn't so much that these things were worthless to Paul, but compared to the greatness, right? And this is, this is the perspective, right? That we look at life, the, all these things that were gained to him, all this knowledge, all this information, right? All this wisdom that he had, his religious pedigree, and so forth and so forth, compared to the greatness of the excellence of the knowledge of Christ, they were really nothing in Paul's life. They didn't mean anything. All of the statue that he had and that he, that he gained fr- throughout his life He finally came to that place in his walk when he came to Jesus. He realized that none of that stuff mattered. None of that stuff meant anything. Compared to that greatness. And Paul puts puts here a personal relationship with Jesus Christ at the very center of the Christian's life. And he he joyfully accepted the loss of all of the things for the greatness of this personal relationship. Paul says here that he counted in this verse, or excuse me, in verse 7, if you look back at verse 7, he says, I counted, and in this verse, he says, I also count. The first thing that he also uh, that he counted was at his conversion, and the second, I also count, is here now as we're looking in his life some 30 years later that we get to look at his life. And so here's the, here's the reality. 30 years ago, when he was at the, the, the peak of his peak, when he was at the top, right, of all this information, and, and, and God met him there right on the road to Damascus and saved him and brought him out of that place of darkness, right? In that moment, he says, I counted, right? So it was the moment at his conversion the second he became a believer in Christ and, and, and the scales were, were removed from his eyes and he was able to see clearly, he counted his life as rubbish, as garbage, as, as dung, literally what it means as like dog poop. You know what I mean? That was, that was how he looked at it, everything else when it, when it came to the reality of knowing Jesus on a personal level and the excellence that came from that very thing. That was at the moment of conversion. But you know how it is. Some things happen 30 years go by, and sometimes we start to change the mindset again. And we might revert back to old ways. But here we see Paul some 30 years later, and he still had that same mindset. Not only did he count, but I also counted. I counted, and I also count. 30 years later, when he's in a Roman prison, after all he had experienced, he still counted it worthy to give up everything for the sake of following Jesus. That that still was, a, was probably one of the greatest, if not the greatest decisions that he ever made, was that he came to that place and he surrendered all before him, and even 30 years later when he's locked up and he has, still has nothing, when everything else is gone, and he's lost it all. After 20 years of experience of Paul going through situation after situation after situation of being shipwrecked, beaten down, brutally beaten and and, and drug out and thrown out of the city to die and so forth and so forth, put in jails and everything that he went through, he still could look back some 20, 30 years later and look at his experiences and look at the balance sheet. You know, sometimes you've got a little bit more knowledge now, right? You've been through a little things. You've gone through some situations. You can look back at your life and you can say, well, you know what? I was young. I had a little more energy in my life. You know, maybe I was able to go through those things. But now, you know what? I, I look at that and think to myself, you know, maybe that wasn't the brightest decision. Probably wasn't the smartest. Whatever the case is. But he looks back in his life, revisits all those things that he had given up. 
takes stock of all his situation in his life, and he still counts all things lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. For whom I have suffered all things. This counting loss was not merely an internal spiritual exercise for Paul. Paul indeed had suffered the loss of all things that he might gain Christ. Now that's the other side of the story, right? You ask yourself the definition of success, right? What it, what it looks like to you in your life. And then what are you willing to go through to, to, to experience that success or that successful life in Christ? What are you willing to go through to experience that in your life? If the Lord told you that you were going to have your Christian career, if you will, be likened that to, to, to the prophet Isaiah and his life. Here you have an individual who was given a call to speak judgment to a people. Right? One of my favorite verse, or chapters in the Bible is Isaiah check, uh, chapter 6, right? And, and we look at the call of Isaiah in his life, and, and you look at the situation. Here you have a person who's been told that you're going to receive this ministry. And the, the ministry that you're going to receive is you're going to speak, you're going to speak judgment to a people that are never going to change. They're going to be stiff-necked, hard-hearted. They're going to shut their ears to everything you say. You're going to speak judgment to them, and they're going to hate you for it. And not one person is going to be saved. Here's your ministry. This is where I, this is where I want you to go preach to these people. There's going to be absolutely no fruit with all the work that you do and all the preaching and all the, 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 the speaking of the message of judgment in these people's lives, and nobody's going to change. But I want you to do this. And what did Isaiah say? Forget this, Lord. I don't want no part of this. He said, here I am. Send me. Send me, Lord. Here I am. Right? Because that's the heart, right? We don't look down and say first, okay, Lord, I want you to break it down for me and show me all the fruit. You know, I'm, I'll go out there and start a U-turn, but I want to make sure it's 60, 70 guys, right, 30, 40 women. I want the nice building facility. I don't want to go somewhere where there's a couple people, you know, and, and we find ourselves in that mentality where, yeah, Lord, I will serve you and I will go to the uttermost parts, but, but what's it look like? How does it look? How does it, is it going to be successful? We all want that, right? We all want to see the fruit of our, of our labors, right? But that's not always a reality. What if it is that you never see any fruit from all the work that you've done and do? What if you never get to see anybody be changed, any converts, any lives being transformed? What if it is that you were given a ministry and the ministry that you were given was that very thing, just to, to, just to, to speak the gospel to everybody you come in contact with? And the results, regardless of what happens, that's, that's up to the Lord and the Holy Spirit. You just do what you're called to do. Because the reality is, that's where we are. But when we speak to somebody and we share with them the gospel message, we want them to be fired up like we were when we got it, right? We want them to be excited about it. But was that always the case for us? No. You know, sometimes it's necessary for us to be flat on our back, right? So we have no other opportunity but to look up. And sometimes... It takes that very thing for us to be flat on our back so we have no other opportunity but to look up. But that was the ministry. That was what Paul was called to. Paul counted it as rubbish, literally excrement, dung. The bottom of the bottom, if you will, right? Right? Literally excrement from the body, table scraps, fit only for the dogs thrown to the side. That's what he considered it. 
You see, everything comes secondary. Or should, I should say. Everything should come secondary when it comes to where Christ sits in our lives and the knowledge of him and, and, and knowing him on a personal level. There's a word in the Greek, it's called gnosko. And that means to know exper experientially, right? In other words, it's to know something or someone from an experiential level, right? In other words, you've, you've gone through that situation. You've walked with Jesus. You know what it means to walk with Jesus. You don't just tell somebody, hey, you need to give your life to Jesus because this, this, and this is going to happen. But you tell somebody you need to give your life to Jesus because I know what's going to happen in your life because I've been there, done it. Right? It's that gnosko. It's to know through experience. I've walked that life. I've, I've, I've walked those paths. I've gone through those places. I've been in that dark despair and anguish and lonely and sad and all these things and helpless. And I've been in those moments and I know what the answer is for you if you come to that place in your life and you just surrender and to watch the life that God pours into you when you finally come to that place and say, okay, I'm done. I'm done. I give up. I surrender. Right? And sometimes that place is not all the same for us, right? It, it, it comes in different drastic measures. Some people, like I said, need to be flat on their back. And some people just need to be shown a little love. Paul here would be the same individual that would consider it a privilege, right? Right? That he would come to the place in his life where not only would he, co would he consider everything, the excellence, the money, the knowledge, the, 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 the life experiences, everything that he went through in the flesh that he was about, everything that he knew, he would consider it, 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 it rubbish, he would consider it excrement, whatever the case is. He would consider that secondary to the knowledge and the excellence of knowing Jesus Christ on a personal level. To know him on a personal level is far greater than anything else in the world. But then also, in that, same, in that same note, he would not only consider that rubbish, but he would consider it a privilege to suffer for the name of Jesus. I don't know about you, man, but I'm praying, Lord, take this away from me. I don't want no part of this. I don't want to suffer. But imagine you come to that place of maturity in your walk where you see the struggle. You see the trial. You see the call to suffer. Are you willing to suffer for the name of Jesus? I mean, let's, let's be real, right? How many of us have suffered from our own, I mean, I mean self-inflicted gun wounds? You shot yourself in the foot. And you're suffering because of it. But the, but, the, but the reality is you shot yourself. You know what I mean? You only got to look in the mirror and, and, and say, okay, well, that's your fault. You did this, you know. You're not, you're not being persecuted because you, you went and stole something and then got locked up for robbery, you know, and you're facing all this time. Oh, Lord, I'm being persecuted. I can't, how could this happen to me, you know? No. It was your own stupidity. Shouldn't have been there. Are you hanging out with the wrong people? You know, what's the, what's the saying now, right? You play, you, you play stupid games, you win stupid prizes, right? <laughs> that's the saying now right because you see all these people out there and they're running around doing dumb things and then you wonder the, the, the outcome all of a sudden they're screaming whoa, whoa why is this happening to me well you shouldn't have been running around throwing trash cans through buildings and windows and, and you know they got you on tv on, on camera they got your license plate from your car you think they're not gonna find you like <laughs> you know it's like what was that show it was like the world's dumbest criminals and you see <laughs> You've seen some of the things they did, you know? Well, you look back in our lives, and it'd be like, man, we should have been on that show, you know? Some of the things that we've done. <laughs> it's crazy. But that's the reality. Apart from Christ, you know what? We're, we're, we're foolish. We're, we, we, we do foolish things. But we shouldn't expect a reward or, or even expect that anything good would come out of that. If we're suffering for what we've done, we deserve it. 
But if we suffer for the name of Jesus and, and because we're innocent and we haven't done anything, how much more so, more, more so the reward? You know, and, and even in the, in the scriptures, the Bible speaks about it. It's the same thing when it comes to love. If you love somebody that loves you, that's not tough, right? That's not difficult. If the person next to you loves you as much as you love you, that's a good thing, right? Yeah, you love me, I love me, we love the same person, <laughs> right? What's wrong with that? That's easy. There's no reward in that, right? There's no reward in that. But if you love that person, especially if it's someone close, imagine it's your spouse, your husband, your wife, your kids, whoever it is that just irks you the wrong way, right? But you love that person in spite of them using you. You know they're going to come to you and ask you for more money. They just asked you last week. What'd you do with the other money I just gave you? But they want to keep using you. Spitefully. They got money in the bank and they're asking you for money. Are you going to love that person? Are you going to bless them? Bless those who curse you and spitefully use you? Bless and do not curse. Well, hey, that's a whole other ballgame, man. I respect those who respect me. I show love to those who love me. But that's not what the Bible teaches, right? That's the hardest thing for us, to love the unlovable, to love that person that you know is spitefully using you, to love that person that you know is talking trash on you behind your back. And now you've got to love on them and pray for them. And tell them how much Jesus loves them. And not only tell them, but in your heart. In your heart, when you know you've got anger and malice towards them, to be like, oh, I love you too. (laughs) But not just say it, you've got to believe it. You have to believe it, because if you don't, and, and you're not willing to forgive them, then how do we expect to receive anything from Christ? There's no reward in that. There's no benefit in that. Verse 9, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. Because Paul was in him, to be found in him, capital H, right? To be found in Jesus, in him, he could renounce his own righteousness and live by the righteousness which is from God by faith. We don't receive righteousness or receive these things because of of how good we are and all the good things that we've done and and how much our our good outweighs the bad and whatever the, and I was better today than I was yesterday or whatever the case is. You receive this righteousness. You are right in God's eyes because of the love that he has for you, but also because it comes from God by faith, that you have to believe that he's made you right. Paul here exposed the great difference between legal relationship that is stressed by his opponents and his personal connection with Jesus. The difference is living and trusting in your own righteousness and living and trusting in God's righteousness through faith in Christ. That's the reality. Verse 10, and he says, That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. This was a simple plea of Paul's heart. It was a plea unknown to the legalist, right, who must necessarily focus on his own performance and his status. That's Paul's background. That's where he's coming from. He's coming from a life of where you, who you were who you were because of what you knew and what you did and your status created this righteousness within you. This performance that you put on, this show that you put on. You know, you see it, you see it a lot out there in a lot of these other religions. Where they're out there doing a lot of work. You know, I, I, I've always likened it to this. Granted that you can't go to door to door and you can't, I mean, COVID hit, right? And you thought you weren't going to have Jehovah's Witnesses coming to your door? Well, you don't, but they send you mail. I get so much uh, letters in my mail 
from people that, I don't know how they got my address, but they live down the street from me. They're still doing their religious duty. They have to reach out to a certain amount of people, their, their quota, whatever it is, that they have to meet to, 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 to preach their gospel to people. Well, COVID hits, and what happens? You can't go door to door, right? So what do you do? So you just start sending a mail. You know what I mean? And now I get letters in the mail from the Watchtower and Society and all these different pe people. But you know what? Here's the thing. Granted, it's this religious duty for them. But I tell you what, man, I always said this. I've always told my family this, and I've always said this. Imagine if we were just a fraction of as, zeal, of, of as zealous as they are, right? You know, here these guys, it don't matter, rain or shine, they're on their bike, you know, Mormons, Jehovah's Witness, right? Whatever the case is, they're on their bikes, they're traveling around, they're going door to door, they're telling people, they're passing out their pamphlets, they got their person, they're training next to them, and they're going out there, they're doing their thing. Right? They're doing their thing. They're zealous about it. They're trying to receive this righteousness because of works. Granted, we don't receive righteousness because of work. We don't receive salvation because of work. But you know what? We should be working and we should be about his business once we receive salvation, right? Paul said, man, uh, you know, that, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection. This was a simple plea of Paul's heart. To know Jesus, we talked about it a little bit, the gnosko, right? The, to know Jesus uh, on a personal, experiential level, not, a histor not his historical life. You read about him. You read a lot about his life. You, maybe you've read the Bible multiple times. But it's not the same. It's not the same as knowing his moral example. It's not the same as knowing his historical life. It's not the same as knowing his great work on our behalf that he's done. And those are all great things to know, but that's not what it's about. Knowing Jesus means knowing his power, the new life that is imparted to us now when we die. But not only when we die, that resurrection power, but that same power we can experience right now today on this earth where we sit. Because the same spirit that rose him from the dead is living where? Within every one of us that claim to be believers in Christ. That same power lives in us, that new life power. The power of his re resurrection is an evidencing power. It is the evidence and the seal that everything Jesus did and said was true. It's a justifying power. The receipt of that proof, that sacrifice of the cross was accepted. The payment was paid in full, right? That power that was displayed when Jesus gave his life so that we could have life. But not even the power of the resurrection, the justifying power, the proof and the evidence of his sacrifice that he made, but the fellowship of his sufferings. Knowing Jesus also means knowing the fellowship of his sufferings. We talked about it a little bit earlier. It's all part of following Jesus and being in Christ. We can say that suffering is part of our heritage as children of God. We get to be part of the family of suffering. How many people are excited about that? Huh? Right? <laughs> we get that. It's a privilege. That's an honor that you and I, because listen, not everybody gets that. Let's be real. Not everybody is worthy. Not everybody has been found worthy to suffer for the name of Jesus. That is a privilege for believers. Like I said before, man, we've suffered for a lot of things in our life. Whether you know it or not, man, look back in your life and think to yourself how many times that you've suffered from things that you've done in your life that we've created. Maybe you are right now in this, in this place this morning. Maybe you're in this place this morning and you're suffering because of decisions that you made in your life. 
And so you're suffering because of the mistakes that you made in your life. And you're asking yourself, why, why, Lord, why am I going through these things? Why me? Why must I have to deal with the pain and the anguish of these things in my life? I think a simple change of perspective could help in that situation. Because the reality is, it doesn't matter whether you're there's self-inflicted gun wounds or you find yourself in that trial this morning because you're suffering for the name of Jesus, because you've, you've given up that old life. You've died to that old man or woman. And right now you're walking with Christ, and now you're dealing with the, the repercussions of that very decision to follow Jesus. Regardless of the situation, a change of perspective and realizing the privilege and the honor that it is, instead of playing the victim and saying how bad it is. Because we talked about it before, I've shared with you guys on Wednesdays, we were going through the book of James, and we look at James's life, and it's coming to that place in your walk where you consider it not only a privilege, but you, but, but you, 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 you look forward to that moment because you know it's going to make you a better person. And how does that happen? It happens through circumstantial situations that, that are re evident in your life. And then your faith can be evident to those around you. Right? In other words, it's the situations that you're going through right now. It's the difficulties that you're going through right now. When you have victory and success in the midst of those, people around you get to see that very thing. I don't know about you, but I love seeing somebody that I went through the ministry with or walking with the Lord, or whatever the case is, and to see them years later having victory and success in their life, it gives me comfort. That I know that, hey, you know what? It's not, it's not every day that you see walking and walking and walking and leaving and running back to the old life. But you know what? It's the little glimpse of hope that we get to hold on to to say, you know what? Somebody can do it and have victory and have freedom from the bondage of sin in my life. And if they could do it, I know I could do it. And that's the blessing to me and the honor and privilege of being able to just live my life is, is let me give you that hope if there's no hope. Because when we're in the midst of our situation and our sin, that's, that's where we find ourselves, hopeless. There's no way out. I don't know about you, but that's where I was. There's no way out. There's, there's no way that this ever could get better. There's no way that I could ever have hope from this situation because I'm in despair. But let me tell you this morning, man. You and I not only get to fellowship of his suffering but we can be conformed to his death that i may attain the resurrection from the dead paul wasn't focused on dying morbidly suffering the death in the christian life he saw it as a necessary way to the goal of the resurrection life right now and the ultimate resurrection from the dead suffering was worth it and he considering the greatness of the goal of resurrection from the dead, that one day that you and I have this hope, Thessalonians tells us, right, to comfort, another, comfort one another with these things, with these words, with these sayings, that you and I one day have the hope that we will spend eternity with Christ in heaven. That's what separates us from everybody else. Remember again, Paul wrote this having experienced more suffering than probably you and I will ever experience. He wrote it from the custody of Roman soldiers in a Roman jail. And he didn't write it because of uh, this theological theory that he had and he thought to himself, you know what, this is a pretty good theory that if you could suffer, man, that you could experience this great resurrected life that Christ, no, this wasn't a theory. This wasn't some theological theory or idea that Paul had. This was a lived out connection that he had with God. This is something that he went through with God on a daily basis and, and, and regularly happened in his life of suffering and being broken and being torn down and all these things. And he had victory and success and he lived it out and he proved it by his own life experientially. 
right? Through experience. He knew God on this personal level because he went through it. He's been there and done it. And then in closing, 12 through 14, he says, Not that I have already attained or I'm already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Amen? Listen, Paul's saying, look, I... I know. If anybody can say it, I know I can say it. There's no way that I've attained or that I've even come close to all of a sudden apprehended. You and I might be able to say that, but the problem is Paul had to write it. Why? Because there are those that believe that. Paul realized he had not arrived. There was only one option open for him. If he hadn't arrived and he had gone through all these things and he had experienced all this heartache in his life and suffering and so forth, and he knew in the midst of that that he hadn't arrived, then he can be able to share to us. So then what's the natural response? Press on. Keep pushing. Keep moving. There's no other response. Keep doing it. Keep on suffering. Keep on going through it. Keep on doing what you're doing because there's no other option. It's not an option. The problem is when we give ourselves the option, now we've given ourselves a way of escape. When you don't give yourself an option, like every day I wake up in the morning and I go to work, I don't sit there on my bed and say, you know what, maybe I won't go today. You know, maybe I won't pay the mortgage. And, you know, I think today, you know, today's a good day I'm going to stay home, you know. And now I go, it's not an option. I'm like a robot. I get up and I brush my teeth and wash my face and I get dressed and I push my stuff in my pocket and I'm on the road. I don't even know half the time I'm driving sometimes. I just show up to the job site. How did I get here? I don't know. Ways. Ways help me. <laughs> Thank God for ways. No joke though. Literally, I'm like, you know, I, I'm doing a job right now in San Pedro. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the area, Terminal Island, over the, over the 47 bridges, right? Right there, Fort MacArthur. Two hours there, two and a half, three hours home every day. Five and a half hours I'm sitting in this truck. I just finished the book of Revelation listening to it, Pastor Chuck. And uh, awesome book. But uh, if I think about how many hours I'm spending in this car, it starts, to, it starts to have an effect on me. So in essence, what I've done is I've, I've kind of like, I've escaped my body. I'm not in there no more. And, and, and I'm just driving, you know, I put it in cruise control and I just go five miles an hour, you know, <laughs> in traffic. But no, I, you know what, it's, it's like, you know, I just, I've become so used to it. So it's like, if, if you're not used to that driving, you're going to jump in that car and you're going to die, right? You're going to be like, oh my gosh, what am I doing? What's, look at this traffic, another accident. Yeah, there's another one, you know, it'll come up. <laughs> um, but, but it, it, so, so kind of, and it's not even anywhere in comparison, but as you go through these sufferings, as you go through these trials, you don't get better at it. They don't get easier. We become better equipped, right? We become better equipped to be able to deal with the struggles, the difficulties. And that's what Paul says here, right? He says, listen, I haven't attained. I'm not perfected. I have, you know what? I, trust me, I'm in the same boat you guys are in. I don't get it sometimes, but I do it because there's not an option. This is it. This is my life. This is the life I've chosen. This is the life that chose me, right? This isn't, this isn't an option. You do it. You don't quit. You don't give up. You don't go back to the old life. It's not an option. There's only one option to press on, keep pushing forward, right? Keep on keeping on, fight the battle, run the race, because you're not happy you just got in the race, and you're not happy because you've got a number on your shirt, you're running. No, you want the prize. I don't know about you, but I want the prize. Paul realized he hadn't arrived. It wasn't an open option for him. He says, but I press on. He put his hand to the plow, and he refused to look back. Luke chapter 9, verse 62, that's the heart. Put your hand to the plow. 
You don't look back. You keep on trucking. Pressed on for what Jesus wanted. His effort was put forth to do God's will and not his own. To receive the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Paul was focused on one thing and would not let those things which are behind him distract him from it. He pressed on for the prize. And that's the other thing. Don't get distracted. Don't be distracted. You start looking back. You start thinking back to your old life and the way that you used to live and thinking that it was, yeah, you know, that wasn't too bad, huh? No. I look back and think of the times when I was homeless on the streets, covered in boils and sores from bad, dirty dope, by myself, nobody around, burned every bridge, and think back, oh, that's what I want to go back to now not an option it's not an option it's only one option keep on pushing keep pushing forward it's not going to get easy it's only going to get harder but i promise you he's with you and you will become better equipped to then be able to show hope to somebody next to you that there's a way out if you keep on fighting amen Amen. Let's pray. Father, we come before you and we thank you for the example of Paul. We look at his life, God, and his experiences that he went through to know you on a personal level and to realize everything else is rubbish. Father, this morning, that's our hearts, that we pray, God, that you would give us that very perspective and mindset, God, that we would look at the past and realize that's exactly where it deserves to be in the past. And Father, that you've given us a renewed spirit the resurrection power that lives within us to keep fighting and pushing on to the utmost call of Christ Jesus in our lives, and that is to serve you and be here for you and by you. Help us to remember that, Lord. Give us faith and understanding when we go through difficulties to know that it's all going to be worth it. Your word tells us, God, and we stand on the promise this morning that you promised us that all things work together for good for those who love you and are called according to your purpose. But you never promised us, Lord, that all things would be good. You promised us all things will turn out to be good. And so help us, Father, to press on, to keep fighting, to not look back, to not look to the left or right, but we'd focus on you and what you've done in our lives and to consider it a privilege, Father, that we might suffer for your name, that we might give this hope that you've given to us to all that we come in contact with. Father, may we look at the life of Paul and may it encourage us to live our lives how you called him, may you call us. And may we have the heart of Isaiah here we are, Lord. Send us. Send me. Whatever you have in store. Not my will, but your will be done. And may we give you way for you to move powerfully in our lives. Bless your children this morning, Lord. Bless this, this word that you've put forth. And may it just resonate in our hearts and minds. And turn us into the men and women that you called us to be. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys.